Hello, uh, this is my current, current COVID digs uh, in the house. Uh, yes, I have COVID. Um, but I thought I would try to follow through the devotional that I said I would do for Dan. Um, this is about facing your fears. And it's actually a pretty meaningful topic to me because I feel like my whole walk with the Lord has been one large facing my fear thing. <clears throat> it's amazing how much fear we, we just don't even know. We're not even aware that we have uh, in this life until God shows it to us, uh, which he's certainly been faithful to do in my life. Um, but I wanted to start out with the uh, passion translation of Gabriel's visitation of uh, Mary. So let me read that to you. During the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you, and so you are anointed with great favor. <clears throat> Mary was deeply troubled over the words of the angel and bewildered over what this may mean for her. But the angel reassured her, saying, do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. I think that bears repeating. Do not yield to your fear, which so often we do, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I do. You will become pregnant with a baby boy and you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the son of the highest and the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Mary said, but how could this happen? I am still a virgin. Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness will fall upon you, and Almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. This is why the child born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your aged aunt, Elizabeth, has also become pregnant with a son. The barren one is now in her sixth month. Not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. Another line to consider there. Not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. Yeah, I wonder sometimes how much we really believe that. Then Mary responded saying, This is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. I just can't even imagine that. I mean, you know, oh my gosh. You know, really? You accept whatever he has for you. Oh my gosh, your whole life is going to be turned upside down. And you accept whatever he has for me. Okay, wow. Yeah, I can't say that I've always had Mary's response. She ends by saying, may everything you have told me, may everything you have told me come to pass. And the angel left her. Wow. <clears throat> Pretty profound. So I want to tell you a story. Um, because I'm a storyteller, that's what I do. Um, several years ago, the Lord began speaking to me about a special project for a tour of roses, a tour of roses being our project of um, healing and reconciliation that we do with roses, long stem roses, that, hence the name, a tour of roses. Anyway, um, we had taken it to Germany and Poland and many different places uh, there. Um, handing out roses as a tangible display of the extravagant love of God. And a lot of people very moved by that. But in 2014, um, between projects, 
uh, I remember being at my friend's church on a Sunday night and uh, doing worship. And in the middle of worship, I suddenly hear something. Okay, now I'm worshiping the Lord and I hear something that is very disturbing. Okay, all the more disturbing because I think it's actually God. And uh, it's just one word. It's so politically not correct for me as a Jew who's a believer, you know. And uh, the word is Palestine. I'm like, and I remember, I still remember my response was immediately, God, surely you must mean Israel, you know, like, what arrogance on my part, right? I'm going to tell God, you know, like what he really means, you know. Um, but I'm freaked. And I hear nothing, nothing more than that. And then about two weeks later, I don't know where I was or what was going on. I hear, these are my people also, and I have not forgotten them. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh no, I'm really in trouble now. Okay, because it looks like that's not my thinking. Those are not my words. This is not anywhere, anything I want to do. And uh, so I, I, I go running to my friend Lynn Corey and I ask him, please, pr please pray for me. Okay. Uh, I think God might be calling me to take a tour of roses to the Palestinians. Like, they can't even be the Palestinians, right? I mean, you know, in Messianic Jewish circles, we don't, that's like, there is no such thing as the Palestinians, right? So, I, I mean, it's just very upsetting, you know. So, on, on all kinds of levels, all right. So, anyway, Lynn starts praying for me. I don't hear a word he says. What I do hear is, and they loved not their lives. And I'm like, where is that? And it's from Revelation 12, and it, you know, is referring to the martyrdom. <clears throat> but in this case, for me, what I felt like God was getting at was, so you've made your peace with Germany and Poland and Northern Ireland, but, uh, you know, the Palestinians are not okay. And <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so I, I went... I went to Jerusalem in January 2015 with my friend, Evie, you know, and uh, we decided to hole up in Jerusalem and pray and see what God would do. And I remember going to the Wailing Wall um, and uh, taking a seat, you know, uh, back from the wall, looking at it, opening my journal, and asking God, you know, what are we doing here? <clears throat> and uh, waiting. And then I hear. And again, it's very disturbing. It's not pleasant. It's not nice. It's disturbing, you know. And what I feel like God is saying to me is, um, I will not hold you guiltless if you do not speak and do what I have called you to. And I'm like, Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not good at this. I'm really not good at this. And I'm especially not good at Israel, Palestinians, Arabs, Jews. No. Yeah. So anyway, I had no idea how we were going to get into Bethlehem. And as it turned out, my friend Evie had to go before we found a way in. But... Uh, certainly did find a way into Bethlehem and ended up there uh, for a day. It was actually all day Saturday. Uh, my plane left on Monday. And um, the South African pastor we met earlier in the week, uh, she was kind of my hostess, you know. She with her Palestinian friend who's a brand new believer the Palestinian friend was scared out of his mind um, that I would let people know that I was Jewish uh, while we were walking around in Bethlehem and then later in Dehisha, the uh, refugee city. Um, but uh, so he begged me not to. He basically begged me not to say anything about being Jewish, you know, 
And as we were walking around in uh, Dehisha, the refugee place, I realized I didn't really want to say anything, you know, because all these men are wearing these uh, Arafat kerchiefs and I'm trying to smile and say hello, you know, and they're like, they're like, you know, n no approach, non-accessible. And I'm thinking, God, what, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? These people are never going to hear me. They're never going to receive anything from us. They, this is just, this is crazy, you know, and I'm, I'm freaking out slowly, you know, and then Underneath it all is this little whisper, little tiny whisper, you know, of God. Look how beautiful the roses would be against all this barrenness, lack of color, you know. Wouldn't it be amazing, your crimson roses, you know, in this place, you know, where there's so little color. And I'm like, aha, 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 you know. So we stayed there late into the night, you know, uh, her friend, you know, offered, you know, hospitality that we could stay the night, but I had to get out of there because by then my stomach was roiling. I was so sick in my stomach. I was freaking out, you know. So eventually around nine or 10 o'clock at night, you know, uh, the cousins got us a ride out of uh, Bethlehem, out of Dehisha, and back into Jerusalem, and I got back to Tel Aviv. And I'm the whole way back, I'm driving from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. I'm like, I'm really sorry, God, I can't do this. I just, you know, I just, there's no way I can do this. I'm the wrong person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> whole bit. And I remember waking up the next day and I was like going to walk this out with God all over the beach. For six hours, I'm walking all over the beaches in Tel Aviv, you know, basically talking to God, talking to God, talking to God. And finally, I stop, you know, finally I'm done, and I start listening. And he's, like, telling me things, telling me, you know, what's going to be, and how, how's it going to be, and all of this kind of thing. And everything he said came to pass. In 2016, we did a project you know, in, in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, we gave out 7,500 long stem red roses. We saw 17 Muslims come to the Lord. It was, uh, it was a mind blower to me. I, I, didn't, I didn't expect anything like that. You know, God did miracle after miracle for us. Um, but we all had to face our fears. Every single person on the team, and there were 17 of us, each of us had to face our fears. And I still remember as we were standing <clears throat> about to go out from the hotel in Bethlehem to stand out on the street and start giving out roses for the first time, you know, like, what's, what's this going to be? What's this going to look like? You know, and what it looked like was Palestinians were hungry, hungry, hungry. They were people starving for kindness. They needed the mercy of God. They were scared. They were hurting. They were just people. And, uh, the beauty of those roses, you know, caught their attention, caught their imagination, spoke to them about a kindness that they really didn't experience. And I still remember what one of our teams said to me. She's Palestinian and spoke fluent Arabic. She says, you know, people come, you know, people come to uh, Bethlehem to buy, get a deal, you know, see the sights, you know, uh, even convert us. Uh, she said, but nobody ever comes here just to love us. And that was really powerful. So I don't know if I'll ever be in Mary's shoes where I'm going to stand and say, may it be unto me, you know, um, or I accept whatever he has from me, you know. I, I think I'm closer to that than I've ever been in my life, but I still, I still look at that statement from a young girl with so little life experience, <clears throat> and I marvel, and I think I have a long way to grow. So Abba, I thank you for my friends, and I thank you, Father, for this journey that we're all making right now. And I do pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord. You would help us hearken to Mary's words, that uh, she trusted you enough immediately um, 
just say whatever you want to do, do it. Lord, let it be unto us as, as you will, Lord God. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you that you understand us so well, God. And I pray, Father, that love would triumph over fear in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Trust in you.